Hello everyone and welcome to this research methods video on the features of science. Now this topic concerns itself with this ongoing debate in psychology as to whether or not psychology can actually be considered a science or not. Um, and to actually answer that question it's really important to be able to identify and to kind of look at the different aspects of what makes a science and how psychology, if at all, actually fulfills these expectations or whether psychology actually doesn't and, you know, shouldn't be considered a science. Okay, so the features that we're going to look at and that all sciences should have um, are as follows. So you've got objectivity and the use of the empirical method. You've got replicability and falsifiability. Theory construction and hypothesis testing and then the existence of paradigms and paradigm shifts as well. Okay, so before we go on to what these things actually are, we'll have a little look at what these could look like in an exam, just so that you know what you are looking out for. You've got three examples there of what this could look like in an actual paper. So the first one is fairly clear-cut, fairly straightforward. Explain one reason why it's important for research to be replicated. Um, the second one is more of an application, so you've got to refer to the study above and explain why a specific approach, so namely the psychodynamic approach, um, has often been criticized for neglecting the rules of the scientific approach. And then you've got to use, in question three, you've got to use the information that you're given to explain why that particular information could be considered scientific. So let's make a start. So we're going to start off with objectivity and the empirical method. So a key feature of science is the ability for researchers to remain objective, meaning that they must not at any point ever let their personal opinions, their judgments, biases, or anything like that interfere with the data that they're gathering. So in psychology, lab experiments are the most objective method that they can use because of the high level of contr control that they have over the variables. You've also got other studies that are, or other types of experiment that are much less um, objective. So things like natural experiments um, are less objective because you know you can't really control um, the independent variable or any of the other variables for that matter as well. So for that reason, natural studies are very often considered less scientific or less um, objective and therefore less scientific. Um, similarly, you've got observational research and with that I also take content analysis into account as well. Um, they can also fall victim to objectivity issues because the behavioral categories that are assigned are very often assigned at the personal discretion of the investigator. So they're a personal choice, they're not an objective choice, they're, they're a subjective thing and therefore you have these issues of objectivity to, um, to contend with in observational studies as well. If you are being objective, then you are not letting your own personal opinion get in the way of the results. That means the results that you are presenting are the results that were true and valid and unbiased. Okay, They weren't your truths, they were the actual truths. Okay, And then moving on to the empirical method. Um, the empirical method refers to the idea that knowledge is gained from direct experiences in an objective and systematic and controlled manner. The idea that it produces quantitative data that can be measured and that can be seen as objective. Um, it also suggests that we can't create knowledge based on belief alone. Okay, and therefore, any theory needs to be empirically tested and verified in order to, to be considered scientific. Okay, so if we're creating a theory based on what we think is happening or what we believe is happening rather than what we've actually seen happen, then that would be considered um, unscientific. Okay, so adopting an, an empirical approach reduces the opportunity for researchers to actually make unfounded claims um, based on subjective opinion. It means that people and researchers are making claims based on facts, based on things that they've seen, based on things that they've observed, and so on. Okay, so that again increases the objectivity and increases the validity of the study that they're doing or the findings that they're presenting. 
Okay, so that's the first bit. Moving on, we have now got replicability and falsifiability. Okay, so something is considered um, scientific if it is replicable. Okay, so replicability is a key feature of science and it refers to the ability to conduct research over and over and over again and achieve consistent results. Okay, so if the findings can truly be generalized and therefore truly be valid, psychologists would expect that you know any replication of a study using the same procedures um, would pr produce similar findings and reach the same conclusions. Okay, that's a nice, easy, quick one. Moving on, uh, we've got falsifiability. Okay, falsifiability um, refers to the idea that truly scientific research needs to have the ability to be proven wrong. Okay, so scientific research can never be proven to be true. You can only really subject it to research attempts to prove them as false. Okay, so you need to be able to prove it wrong or at least be given the opportunity to prove it wrong. Okay, so for that reason, all investigations have a null hypothesis. I'm sure you've come across those in research methods already, and the null hypothesis always suggests that any difference or relationship um, is due to chance or you know, isn't really due to the manipulation of the IV. So if you think back to your topics that you've gone through in psychology, there is one particular one that... Uh, very often is considered as being unfalsifiable, so it lacks falsifiability, and that is Freud's psychodynamic approach. So a central principle of the approach is that the notion of the Oedipus complex, and the Oedipus complex occurs for boys during childhood, and you know the Oedipus complex is all about resolving an unconscious sexual desire for um, the opposite sex parent in order to develop um, the superego. If a male individual refutes the idea, so if the if a male individual denies this idea that he's gone through this particular stage of psychosexual development in his youth, a psychodynamic theory would just say, well, that you don't know you've gone through that stage because you were in denial. You've used a, a defense mechanism and you're in denial. Or it's been repressed and pushed down into unconscious memory. So at that point, you're creating a little bit of a circular argument and you can't actually prove the theory wrong. So if somebody says, I didn't experience that, somebody else would come back and say, it's because you've repressed it or it's because you're in denial. So how am I ever going to prove that as being wrong? Okay, so that particular theory, because of that, is unfalsifiable, and that makes it very unscientific. Okay, I hope that falsifiability bit has made sense. That's a fairly important one, and one that you maybe haven't come across very often um, so far. Okay, moving on. Theory construction and hypothesis testing. Also a fairly simple one to kind of get your head around. A theory is a set of principles, a set of principles that intend to explain a certain behavior or an event. Okay, but to construct a theory, evidence to support the idea of this theory needs to be collected first. Okay, because as we've already talked about earlier, if you're using the empirical method, it doesn't allow for knowledge to be based solely on beliefs. It has to be based on facts and observed phenomena. So we need to collect some evidence before we can make a theory. So if a researcher suspects that something is true, they need to devise some kind of an experiment that will allow them to examine their ideas. Okay, And if they start to discover a pattern or a trend in their research, then they can start to think about constructing a theory. Okay, So that particular process is called an inductive process. It's also sometimes known as um, a bottom-up approach. Okay, So you start with something quite big, and then you hone it into something that's quite exact and quite specific. Um, that's kind of highlighted by the picture there on the left. And then after that, researchers can start to make predictions about what they expect is going to happen. And as I'm sure you're aware, a prediction made by a scientist is also known as a hypothesis. 
So that's your theory construction part of things. Okay, so you can't just you can't just uh, make a theory based on beliefs. You have to devise some kind of experiment to kind of see if there's something objective and something visible and measurable that you can kind of base your ideas on. And then, um, as and when you've done that, you've got your theory. Then you can start making predictions about what's going to happen, which is your hypothesis. Your hypothesis is very very important. So when you're designing a hypothesis, it has to be objective and measurable so that at the end of the investigation a clear decision can be made as to whether or not results have supported or disproved the hypothesis. Okay, so if the findings support the hypothesis, then the theory's been strengthened. If the hypothesis has been refuted, then it's likely that you need to make some kind of alterations to your theory um, and try again. Just as a little side note at this point, you see this happening quite a lot in um, in prevalent theories in psychology. So, for example, uh, if you take models of memory, just as an, just as an example, um, the models are always changing because if you have an idea, you do some research into the idea, you get your hypothesis, and you think something's going to happen, and then something doesn't happen, and so you need to change your model a little bit. So we had that with the multi-store model, where it turned out actually long-term memory and short-term memory weren't um, unitary. They were lots of different stores. So the multi-store model all of a sudden didn't work anymore. So we moved on to the, uh, to the working memory model. Working memory models working out fine um, until some research was done that suggests the central executive isn't actually one store, but it has lots of little bits inside it. So again, the model has to be changed based on the findings um, of some research, which is either refuted or supported. Um, your hypothesis. Okay, so it's just a little bit of an idea of how that works. Right, you've got your final bit now, and that is all about paradigms and paradigm shifts. Okay, this is the final feature of science. So a paradigm is a set of shared assumptions and methods within a particular discipline. Okay, so it's a a set of beliefs, you could say, that everybody within a particular discipline shares. Um, example, very easy and old example, is that the world is round. Okay, that's a shared assumption amongst scientists of, of all disciplines. Um, the earth is round. Okay, now the thing is, that is the paradigm at the minute. That paradigm wasn't always like that, because for a very, very long time, everybody thought the world was flat. Okay, so we went for many, many, many hundreds of years thinking the world was flat, uh, until at some point we realized actually it's not flat, it is, it is in fact round. So at some point, the general collective idea was challenged by a new idea, by a new way of thinking. Okay, and then slowly but surely, this idea of the world being flat um, kind of died out, and the new paradigm appeared, and that is that the Earth is round. Okay, so what happened there was that there was a paradigm shift. Okay, so there was a new idea, a new way of thinking, which had become popular amongst a small minority, and then consequently, the old ways were beginning to get challenged, and more and more people started to believe in this new paradigm, the world is round. Um, uh, until that new way of thinking becomes the norm and becomes the accepted way of thinking. Okay, now Kuhn in 1962 suggested that actually this idea of a paradigm um, was what separated a scientific discipline from a non scientific discipline. This idea of having a shared set of beliefs and a shared set of methods and a shared set of assumptions. Um, was what set sciences aside from or from non sciences, and because of that assumption that Kuhn made, he suggested that psychology was perhaps best seen as more of a pre science rather than an actual science, separate from things like biology and physics and chemistry. And the reason he said that was because actually psychology has got far too much disagreement at its core between the various approaches. So you've got the behaviorists and you've got the cognitives and you've got the psycho um, psychodynamics and you've got the humanists and you know you've got all these people that are kind of arguing. Um, as much as there is now 
there is a, a way of thinking that is the most popular or the most common. There is still far too much disagreement at the core of psychology. And we are, as psychologists, unable to agree on one unifying approach to actually consider ourselves a science. So Kuhn is very much of the of the opinion that actually psychology isn't a science because we can't agree on an approach to believe in or an approach to kind of unite everybody um, under the same set of beliefs. Now, paradigm shifts in psychology have been quite frequent and quite, you know, they're quite popular, I suppose, um, over the years. Um, so, I mean, if you think about it, in the late 19th century, you had the you had the psychodynamic approach. So Freud was about and he was talking about the role of the unconscious and using psychoanalysis and all of that. And then around the 1920s, the behaviorists started to, approach, uh, to appear. And, you know, people like Pavlov and Skinner and Watson, they started uh, to adopt this position that all behavior was learned from the environment and from experiences. But it didn't stop there, because then in the 1960s, so not that long after that, um, in the 1960s, the cognitive psychologists started to appear. And there was this cognitive revolution, um, which kind of came with the development of the computer when started looking at the brain as being like a computer and all of that. So at that point, the shift from behaviorist thinking was more towards the role of cognitions in explaining behavior. Um, and even though the cognitive approach still uses elements of the behaviorist approach, you know, in CBT and that kind of thing, the dominant paradigm very much became then cognitive psychology. And very much now it's moving towards cognitive neuroscience as well. So we're in the kind of in the midst of, a, of another um, paradigm shift, or I suppose we're, we're kind of already towards the end of it, I suppose. Um, but, you know, paradigm shifts in psychology happen fairly regularly. Um, so just something to be aware of, of how psychology has changed throughout the, um, throughout the years. So just before the end of the video, if I just quickly put up those exam questions again from the beginning, and you can have a little bit of a look um, at how you might go about answering them or which particular features of science you might talk about. So question one, for example, the importance of replicability. So it comes back to how valid is the actual research. If the research can be replicated and you can get consistent results, then you would imagine that it is um, a valid piece of research and that the results are valid as well. You know, the psychodynamic approach in question number two, you would talk about the fact that they don't really go through the scientific method and they don't really go through empirical testing or anything like that. They also don't use um, falsifiability. So the, you know, the actual example that I gave you in the video was that the Oedipus complex and lots of other bits of the psychodynamic approach can't actually be falsified. Okay, so they don't meet the scientific criteria in that way. And in question number three, you could talk about a whole range of things. So you could say the researcher has gone through the whole process of theory construction and hypothesis testing. You could say that she's used empirical methods. It's all objective. She's got quantifiable measures. She's used statistical testing. It's open to falsifiability. There's a lot there that you could talk about. Um, so they're just a few examples of how this topic has come up in the past. Um, and how it could come up in the future as well. All right, that is the end of the video. Um, it's quite a wordy topic, so um, I hope it's made sense, um, and I hope it's been useful as well. All right, thank you very much for listening.